Good evening. Good evening. I'll invite you to turn to Galatians 3 as I begin. So there are times in my life when I wonder if I will go to heaven when I die. The difference between heaven and hell cannot be described in words, and it's a matter of eternal consequences. Even in recent times, I find myself re-asking this question, what if I don't make it to heaven? Do you ever think like this? If you do, then be assured that you are not alone. The context of Galatians provides us with a scenario in which there were people who had received the gospel, but then, after that, they were persuaded to believe that they truly weren't saved because they still had to do more. Paul planted churches in the province of Galatia on his first missionary journey. The book of Galatians was Paul's way of checking in with these churches that he started. However, in this case, there was a more urgent need for writing the letter. It wasn't a simple, so how are things going? Paul found out that there were false Jewish teachers who were spreading misinformation about what the gospel entailed. Paul addressed this immediately after his greeting, and he assured the Galatians that he had experienced a divine calling to the gospel. He had seen Jesus Christ himself, and therefore he knew what the true gospel was. What usually blinds our assurance of salvation, that also blinded the Galatians, is our own performance. We might compare ourselves with other believers we know, and we conclude that we just don't hold a candle to their enthusiasm or their biblical knowledge. We think that our own lives are still filled with too much sin. Or another possible misconception is that we think we have to contribute a certain number of good deeds in our lifetime to be accepted by God. Now these are worthy considerations for a Christian for a matter that has so much weight to it, but none of those things are the conditions or qualifications of salvation. Now Paul explores and explains this idea in Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 29. The text develops three major points. First, that salvation is not based on performance. Second is that the purpose of is the purpose of the law in salvation, and third, he discusses the completion of salvation through the work of Christ. So follow along with me at the beginning, Galatians 3:15. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God, so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise." So beginning the passage is the idea that salvation is not based on performance. This is the first major point of the text. Notice the first words of the passage, to give a human example. That's a sign that we need to observe what was just said before this. I'm sure we all know that no argument would make sense if it begins with, here's an example. So the last words of verse 14 are, that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So now we understand that in verse 15, Paul is giving a familiar human example of what it is like to receive God's promise. He just wants to put it in terms that the Galatian people will understand. So this human example that Paul illustrated was a man's will before death. God's promise parallels a man wishing for certain belongings to be given to certain people. A man has the right to keep and give his possessions as he chooses. Now, we can look at this example from the correct angle. Paul is saying men understand that changing or disregarding somebody else's will would be dishonest. And even more so, God's promise is an unchanging will. There is no one who can interfere with it because he possesses all things and is in control of all things. Paul refers to the Genesis account of God's promise to Abraham to prove that 
Salvation does not come through obeying the law. We know that Abraham lived before the law was established, and he was saved by faith. Paul is referring to God saying, I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And that is Genesis 17, 8. In addition to this, Paul makes specific mention that there's only one offspring of Abraham's to whom this promise applies, and that is Christ. Now, why did he need to say that? The reason is because God's will was twofold. Theologian John Stott explains this promise well. The promise referred to the land of Canaan, which God was going to give to Abraham's physical descendants, but it also referred to salvation, the spiritual inheritance, to believers who are in Christ. In saying that the promise was for one offspring of Abraham, we conclude that there has to be some other meaning besides Canaan, because there were so many of Abraham's descendants that reached Canaan. In other words, how could the promise only be for one offspring when many Israelites settled in the promised land? And that's where the second meaning of the promise comes in. So far, Paul has explained God's promise is like an unchanging will, which states that spiritual inheritance belongs to all believers in Christ. At this point, he makes mention of the law and that it has no effect on God's promise. The law is what was causing trouble for the Galatian people. False teachers persuaded them to believe that strict obedience to the law was, and circumcision were required. But Paul is claiming just the opposite. Because God had confirmed his promise before he ever gave the law, the law cannot have authority over the promise. Paul also makes the argument in verse 18 that salvation cannot come from both the promise and the law. It must be one or the other, because the promise requires God to take full action, whereas the law requires people to take full action. Martin Luther puts it like this, The law thunders, thou shalt, and thou shalt not. The promise of the seed pleads, take this gift of God. So do you see how both of these things cannot simultaneously be the answer to salvation? I cannot accept salvation as a gift, but also claim that I deserve salvation because I obeyed God's commandments. Thus far, we have established that salvation originates from having faith in God. Abraham was called out by God without having done anything particularly special, but he would receive blessings if he had faith. In fact, Joshua 24.2 notes that Abraham was among the idolaters with his father, and still, God showed him favor. This raises a question. If the promise is a gift, and the law is a set of requirements, what purpose does the law serve? Did Israel have to abide by the law, since they already had their inheritance waiting for them? And the next section of the text answers this question, and it begins to explain what the function of the law is. This is the second major point. So let's read again, starting from verse 19. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not, for if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Paul raised the question himself and was ready to explain that the law was not useless. Rather, it served a different purpose from the promise but each of those purposes would still point to the same end, which is Christ. The purpose of the promise was to give an inheritance, while the purpose of the law was to expose people's sin and need for a savior. The promise of inheritance points to Christ because he would be the one by which people receive their inheritance. And the law points to Christ 
because disobedient sinners will realize they need someone else to help them out of judgment. Again, understand that the law was not useless for Israel just because they were already promised an inheritance. It wasn't as if they could simply ignore the law because God can't go back on his word, and therefore they had nothing to worry about if they did anything they wanted. The law was put in place to guide the Israelites to the state of mind that they were lost on their own, unholy and separate from God. The law caused the Israelites to long for a redeemer and be saved by faith that such a redeemer would come. This longing for the Messiah is a sign that while the law serves an important purpose, it's not the central hope for salvation like the promise is. The law was temporal, not meant to bind people forever. Paul writes in verse 19, till the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. Once Christ arrived, the promise was now in motion, and the spiritual inheritance to believers was opened once Christ's work was accomplished. Christ was the man who surpassed the law, the one to whom the law was looking, and he was the one to whom the promise was speaking of 400 years before the law. The next thing Paul says is that the law was given by an intermediary. So let's look again at verses 19 and 20. It was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Ronald Y.K. Fung, a Chinese biblical studies professor, explains that this idea of mediation also suggests that the law is subject to the promise. He states that mediators of the law would indicate that the law is like a contract in which there are two parties that both have to keep their end of the deal. They each have their side that they have to uphold, whereas the promise is unilateral because only God acts out of grace. We cannot reciprocate God's grace. It is only one way, from him to us. Now, since people could not keep the law, that covenant was broken and a new covenant was needed. We know that Jesus established the new covenant and was the one God promised before the law was given. Let's reiterate what Paul has said about the function of the law. It exposed transgressions. It was temporal because it pointed to a greater end in Christ, and it was like a contract in which both God and man must act. Moving on, he asks if the law contradicts God's promise. Remember that we have already discussed that while the law and the promise have different purposes, they have the same end, which is Christ. Paul's response to his own question is that the law must do the opposite of the promise in order to be in accord with it. It must imprison everything under sin, as it says in verse 22, rather than give life. Because if the law gave life, that would be contrary to the promise because the promise was meant to give life. The law was not supposed to provide a newer, more effective method for inheritance. The one way through Christ will never be out of order or get some new and improved version. It stands the test of time forever. Notice in verse 22 the words, so that. What Paul identifies is that through the law enslaving people under sin, it simultaneously brings everyone into a state from which they can be saved, so that the promise might be given. And the only condition is believing in Jesus Christ. Let's continue to the last section of the text, starting at verse 23. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, The law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. So the third major point of the text is that 
Christ's work completes man's salvation. Read verse 23 again. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. We were held captive, locked up like prisoners and unable to resolve our need. And rightly so are we imprisoned. We have all failed to keep God's law, so we deserve to be judged guilty. Picture being locked behind bars, in restraints, and you have no tools to help you get out. What could you do? Nothing but sit there. You would be stuck right where you are. There's, there's really no hope for you. You wouldn't be going anywhere. No prisoner is ever free until someone else lets them out. Even when the law was active, Israel was meant to have faith in a coming Messiah. They were supposed to recognize that they were in an imprisoned state because the standards of the law were just too high. Their dependence was to be fully on the promised Christ to set them free. We as well must admit that we need someone else to save us. If we refuse to accept an offer from someone else, if we refuse Christ to free us from sin, then we are like criminals with a life sentence who are refusing someone who wants to bail us out of jail because we think we're going to get out on our own. And in fact, the one who wants to bail us out is the one against whom we have committed the crime. Paul was challenging the Galatians to consider that in striving, uh, that in striving for good works, they were insulting the gracious work of Christ. They acted as if it wasn't enough for them. Consider all that Christ did for you. He endured bruises, beatings, he was whipped and mocked. He had to endure betrayal, and he was forsaken by God, his own father. Do you think Christ suffered all these things only to look at you now and say, I regret going through all of that for him or her, and it wasn't worth it? Of course not. Do you think Christ was not aware of the sinners we are before he did all of that for us? Surely he knows. And this is a challenge for us as well, to remember that Jesus paid it all and that he is satisfied in saving us. Paul continues to say that Christ justifies us by faith. In having faith that Jesus covers all our sins and takes all our punishment, we are made innocent. The word until in verse 24 means that the law is no longer our prison guard. Paul reiterates it in verse 25. We are no longer under a guardian. When a prisoner is released, they are entrusted to obey the law, even though they aren't being watched any longer. So that is the case for us. We are not slaves to the law anymore, not today, but still, we are entrusted to do what's right, even after Christ has freed us. John Stott says this beautifully. Only Christ can deliver us from the law's harsh discipline because he makes us sons who obey from love for their father and are no longer naughty children needing tutors to punish them. So when I was a child, I had to be dragged to church by my parents. I never wanted to go. I would try to even fake being sick and get my way out of it. I remember I did that one time. It didn't work, but... The point is that I don't do that anymore. I don't need someone to discipline me and tell me, but you have to go. I don't live at home anymore. I'm away at college, but I still go to church every week because I want to now. And I think it's beneficial for me. And that's the point Paul is making. We no longer need to be reprimanded and disciplined by the law when we sin because we have acquired a love for Christ. And now we want to live for him. The last verses of the passage teach us that justification creates a new identity in believers. That identity is Christ. The first words of verse 26 are, For in Christ Jesus. Paul also stated earlier in Galatians 2.20, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So we are in Christ and he is in us. <clears throat> 
verse 26 continues to say that believers are immediately viewed as sons of God once justified. Jesus is the son of God, and if we are one with him, then we are sons of God as well. Next, Paul mentions baptism into Christ. While faith is what makes a person one with Christ, baptism is a motive that believers have to outwardly show that they have faith. Baptism is a sign that one is buried and resurrected like Christ and that they have new life. The words put on Christ are also referring to an outward action. Think of putting on clothes. That is the way you present yourself to the world. That is how people are going to see you. And often people will advertise something that they enjoy with their clothes. People wear clothes that advertise the music they listen to or the political stance they take or the sports team that they cheer for. So putting on Christ means you want everyone you pass by to know that you care about Christ and that he's precious to you. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There is no superior group of people that Jesus came to save. Everyone needs him just the same. Lastly, verse 29 means that believers share Christ's position as the offspring to whom the promise was made in Gentiles. Earlier, we heard Paul's argument that the offspring was just one offspring. We are all that one offspring because we are one in Christ. The new identity in Christ should convince us that we are secured by God as his own. We might not encounter teachers of a false gospel in the way that the Galatians did, but it is likely that we will raise our own questions and doubts about salvation. It's a comfort to know that the law is not the ultimate test of qualifying for God's kingdom. God always keeps his promises, and he didn't establish the law just to overwrite his gracious gift. The law was meant to turn our eyes upward in hope of the coming Christ. Now, you and I know the story of Christ. We know that he has come and he has done all that he was promised to do. With this assurance, we should live our lives out of a desire to serve him, staying away from evil and clinging to what is good. Let us put on Christ and relate to each other as one body in him with no distinction. In our times of failure, remember that the purpose of the law was to reveal our greatest need our absolute dependency on someone to set us free from the power of sin. This salvation that we all need equally is not based on our performance compared to other people, but on faith in the work of Christ. No one is too far out of reach of God's promise, and to deny that anyone can be saved is to say that Christ's fulfillment of the promise is not enough. His sacrifice is enough, and if we have accepted it, We can certainly rejoice in it and know that with him, the promise of inheritance stands secure forever. Thank you. All right, why don't we pray? Our gracious Father, uh, as always, we are um, we're overjoyed to uh, to hear once again that uh, your your salvation is freely offered to us, and um, I confess, as Paul said, Lord, we are, are uh, we're all too often looking at our own performance, our own set of good deeds, and trying to qualify for salvation, and um, we repent of this, Lord. Um, thank you for your word to us in both the law and the gospel and uh, thank you Lord for showing us the way in which we should walk Um, but you've taken us by the hand you've brought us up to be uh, uh, a part of the body of Christ Uh, you've made us righteous in him and um, we confess Lord we we want our own righteousness and um, often uh, uh, wave Christ away or turn down his offer and and, uh, try to do it ourselves so um, thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for uh, your, your spirit that reminds us you're always with us. You'll never leave us. Uh, your blood 
Your sacrifice is sufficient for all of our need, all of our guilt. And uh, I praise your name, Lord Jesus, because you're sanctifying us, you're making us holy. Uh, you have uh, uh, promised us already uh, salvation, Lord, and so the rest is just the working out of it. Uh, so help my brothers and sisters and me uh, to walk with you, to love your name more than anything, to want to please you, dear Father, uh, to rejoice in the life of holiness that you've called us to and not to think it a burden. Um, and I pray, Lord, that um, as we have our fellowship time and uh, head home this evening, uh, that your spirit would go with us, uh, keep these thoughts fresh in our minds, and not just tonight, but throughout the week and uh, throughout our lives. Thank you, thank you, Lord, for uh, the precious gift of the gospel in your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.